we're a couple minutes yep. past seven o'clock and we've got about 40 people who have joined us here. Uh, so I think we're probably, uh, we're probably good to get going. Um, for those of you guys who, uh, who don't know me, I think a lot of you know me already. My name is Nick Hume. I'm a provincial staff officer uh, with St. John Ambulance here in, uh, in BC. I'm based in Victoria, um, Division 176, where I do most of my work. Uh, joining us tonight, uh, we have Dr. Jonathan Wallace, who has uh, an extensive history with St. John. I'll let him maybe uh, explain his own uh, CV with our organization uh, himself in a moment. Um, he's obviously, as you guys can see on the title slide here, going to be talking about respiratory physiology this evening. Uh, as with our, uh, our, as our usual sort of way of running these talks goes, we'll ask that people uh, type in any questions that they have uh, into the uh, into the chat here. And uh, John said that uh, we can maybe interrupt him to drop questions in uh, um, as he's going, but uh, it's he's going to be focusing on uh, doing his talk. So. If you can type uh, questions into the chat and uh, maybe let myself or, or one of the other admins just jump in at an opportune moment, uh, please and thanks. Uh, as always, and I'm going to answer, I see Patricia Brewster, Brewer, pardon me, from 518 has already typed in a question with uh, if there's any notes about these presentations that, that can be accessed um, uh, via email or anything, um, uh, because the presentations often go a little bit too fast for note taking. Uh, we don't have curated notes anywhere, Patricia. Um, but what we do have is all of these videos get posted to YouTube afterwards. Uh, so you can go to uh, YouTube, search for SJA Vic BC, SJA VIC BC. You'll find our YouTube channel with every single one of our recordings or most of our recordings uh, recorded and posted. Um, a couple of uh, a couple of the talks have been uh, kept uh, private, so they're not publicly viewable just because they had some sensitive content that, uh, that the presenters uh, didn't necessarily want to be available to the general public. But nearly everything is available on YouTube. You can go and watch it 100 times over. Um, and, uh, and that we don't, unfortunately, have curated notes for you, though. Um, with that, I'm going to hand you guys over. Oh, and uh, pardon me as well. Uh, we'll ask everyone to just keep your, uh, keep your cameras and your uh, microphones off or on mute. Uh, if, uh, if you do turn your camera on or your microphone on, uh, one of the admins will probably mute you and turn your camera off again. Uh, we just find that having the camera recordings running alongside the, uh, the presenter's presentation can be a little bit distracting, especially if you turn it on and then forget about it. Um, uh, we, uh, it just goes for a little bit of a smoother presentation if we keep those all off. So, uh, with that, I'm going to give you guys to, uh, Dr. Jonathan Wallace and, um, I'll let John, uh, finish his own introduction and uh, go from there. Thanks, Nick. Hi, everybody. I'm Jonathan Wallace. I'm sure many of you have met me before. I, um, who am I in Division 176? I don't really know anymore. I uh, joined the division in 1997, and uh, I think I've been pretty much a permanent fixture despite the fact I have lived in, and currently live away from Victoria. Um, I think I'm officially a divisional medical officer, but right now my biggest contribution to St. John other than these occasional presentations is that I sit on the National Medical Advisory Group uh, for St. John National when they're making up uh, first aid guideline things. So um, yeah, that's kind of what I'm doing right now. Um, tonight I'm coming to you live from Crow's Nest Pass, which is a little tiny community in the middle of the Rockies, not really the middle of the Rockies, in the edge of the Rockies. And uh, unfortunately, I'm on call for, um, for any sort of catastrophic emergencies. So the good thing is, this is a tiny little community, and it's very unlikely I'll get interrupted. And I have a very good resident who knows what I'm doing and uh, promised not to bother me unless it's life for limb. So uh, I, I don't think we'll have any issues. But just in case uh, I do get a call, I may have to mute myself for a minute, take that, and uh, potentially dash away. Uh, so apologies in advance if that happens. Um, tonight, I am presenting on respiratory physiology as part of our division's deep dive series, which I think is a super cool idea. In St. John, we often go over the same first aid topics over and over, and that's a great thing to do because it's really important to practice these things and keep them fresh in our mind. But it's nice every once in a while to do a deeper dive and get that kind of bigger picture of what's going on, what higher levels are doing to understand why it is that we do the things we do at the level that we operate at. So as Nick has alluded to, I am very um, appreciative of questions as we go. So I think the format, uh, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Nick, is please enter your question in the text. He's going to uh, curate that, and he'll interrupt me if appropriate, and uh, we'll just chat about it right then and there. Otherwise, there'll be plenty of times 
time for questions at the end as well. All right, now my clicker's not working today, so I have to use my arrow key. So let's get started. Let me get on to my correct. There we go. So uh, I don't have any uh, conflicts of interest with presenting this. It'd be really cool if I could copyright breathing and make a fortune, but uh, I can't really do that. So we'll move on. Uh, learning objectives. So from a pre-hospital applicability standpoint, the biggest takeaway tonight is about the bag valve mask. Early on in first aid training and St. John training, we get given these and shown how to use them. But then we, we move on really quickly to other things and we don't realize or we forget how critical the B part of the ABCs is and why it truly demands our ongoing and undivided attention. In my day job, I spend a lot of time teaching qualified doctors how to manage the airway and how to look after really sick people properly. And I can personally attest to the fact that it's much easier to teach somebody to properly intubate and uh, control the airway than it is to use one of these properly. And that's not saying that intubation is easy, it's not. That's saying how difficult it is to properly apply and use a bag valve mask throughout the duration of your time caring for the patient. So that's the overall takeaway from tonight, but we're gonna break it into three parts. First of all, the mechanics of breathing and how not to kill someone with a bag valve mask. Number two, the secret world of carbon dioxide elimination, which we don't really ever touch upon very much in first aid training. It's also known as ventilation, and we're gonna talk about what's really happening in the background while we're obsessing over the oxygenation component. And then lastly, we're gonna talk about why CO2 is so critical and how you could really destroy someone's life if you don't treat the bag valve mask with the respect it deserves. Okay, so uh, we're gonna get into some 3D graphics and, that are gonna blow your mind. I did this myself. Anatomy. So the important parts of the respiratory system is the airway, and then we have some lungs, and microscopically the lungs are made of all these little alveoli, and then the, the uh, whole system is driven by the diaphragm, as well as the sternum and rib and the, uh, the muscles of the chest wall gets really congested really quickly there, so I'm just gonna fade those ribs, make them a little bit more subtle, but we know they're there. All right, good. So having introduced you to my uh, lifelike mannequin here, we'll move on with some physiology. So we'll start with exhalation, and exhalation is the resting state. So when we relax, exhalation begins, and then it, you will stay in exhalation until you uh, put some effort in and initiate another breath. So what happens first is the diaphragm returns to its normal domi self. So watch these little flashes. That's the diaphragm. Watch that subtle little motion there. It pops up to its normal position. And then second, the springy ribs compress the, ch the chest wall. And that all puts pressure onto the lungs. And if the airway is patent, air escapes and everything collapses. Microscopically, microscopically the alveoli are shrinking, the air is escaping from uh, the alveoli as well. But notice how the alveoli only shrink partially. They don't completely collapse. This is exhalation. Now let's talk about inhalation. Classically, we're taught that inhalation occurs when air enters the body, causing the lungs to expand. And microscopically, what we see is the air entering the alveoli, the uh, pop up there. Um, but what's happening here, what, what this is, technically is positive pressure inspiration. And it's caused by something squeezing air into our bodies like this thing. So positive pressure ventilation requires positive pressure outside of our body. And that's not how we breathe naturally. When we breathe naturally, we're using negative pressure inspiration. This is a subtle difference, but it's important, and I'll go over why in a minute here. So in negative pressure, what we're doing is we're creating a vacuum inside this closed intra intrathoracic space. And how we do that is the diaphragm pulls down, and the chest wall muscles will lift up, rotate up, and expand the uh, chest wall by pulling on this way uh, outwards. And so the lung tissue actually adheres to the chest wall. And so what we're actually doing is stretching apart the lungs. And that causes that vacuum effect and that sucks air in. And so microscopically, again, the alveoli are getting pulled apart from the sides and that's pulling air in. It's kind of like a plastic bag. So when, you, when I grab the plastic from either side, there's you know, almost no air in this thing. And then as I pull it, you know, the entire thing, if I didn't have it ziplocked, the entire thing fills up with air. 
right? So that's what's happening. That's negative pressure ventilation, and that's how we breathe uh, most of our lives until we get sick. <clears throat> so why does this subtle difference matter? And it comes down to three different types of concerns. First of all, pressure. When we exert too much pressure with the bag valve mask, meaning that we're with the velocity of, of um, gas moving through the bag valve mask is too much, pressure will build up and you can cause damage. So you don't want to be squeezing the bag valve mask like this. The next thing is volume. And so if you're squeezing too much gas in, then uh, you can potentially over distend these alveoli and pop them and cause all sorts of problems. So that leads to something called volume trauma. And then the third type is something a little bit more technical that we don't really have to worry about too much in, um, in the first responder world, but we'll talk about it anyway. It's called atelectasis, and that calls, causes something called atelectotrauma. So before I move on and talk to you about what atelectasis is, I just want to point out that the negative pressure ventilation that we're always um, breathing, excuse me, naturally, doesn't have these concerns. We have safety mechanisms built in where we don't breathe too fast, or I don't even know if we're capable of breathing fast enough to really cause a uh, barotrauma or um, a volume trauma effect. So this is uh, why negative pressure ventilation, keeping the patient breathing on their own is always preferable to positive pressure with bag valve mask or a ventilator or something like that. Okay, let's talk about atelectasis. Normally when we exhale, like I said before, alveoli don't collapse completely. If they do, and this is not uncommon in severe disease states or under artificial respiratory support, this phenomenon is called atelectasis. And because alveoli have this internal liquid coating that makes them slippery, it actually takes a fair amount of force to reopen them. So if you remember to uh, remember back to Bobby's presentation from a few weeks ago, alveol alve <laughs> can't speak. alveolar walls are generally only a single cell thick because this is where the gas exchange occurs. So they're extremely fragile. So this repeat closing and opening uh, peeling fashion can cause damage. And that damage is known as atelectotrauma. And this again is generally a problem with sick lungs and long-term ventilation. However, at some point you may encounter bag valve masks which have been augmented with peep valves or other fancy doodads and gizmos in an effort to prevent atelectotrauma and the other common causes of lung damage. So. Something just to be aware of, but not, re not a, really a huge concern in, uh, in the first responder world. All right, so bag valve mask, positive pressure ventilation, um, this can be a real problem. And so how do we avoid misusing our bag valve mask? What we do first is we make sure that we inflate the bag slowly, like over three seconds, right? So actually think to yourself, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, and that keeps the velocity and the pressure um, going very slow, very low and, and slowly as possible to allow the lung tissue time to expand. The next step is to inflate just enough to make the chest rise. So the calculation for um, tidal volume, the volume of, of air that we normally breathe, is seven milliliters per kilogram of ideal body weight. So if I'm a 70 kilogram person, then uh, that would be about 490, say 500 milliliters of air that I take in a normal breath when I'm at rest. This bag holds two liters. So when we're squeezing the entire thing in, uh, that's a lot more than my lungs want. So again, what you want to do is gauge how much is enough by watching that chest rise. And as you see it rise, that's enough. That's time to stop. So three seconds to make the chest rise. And then we want to allow enough time for adequate exhalation. So we release and allow three seconds for the air to escape naturally. And this prevents something called breath stacking, where the lungs get fuller and fuller and fuller with each breath until they go kaboom, which is not very good. You can write notes on that. Kabooming of the lungs is not good. So to do this and use the bag valve mask seems really easy, but to do this long term is actually really challenging. Like think about trying to do this for half an hour while you're waiting for an ambulance to come get your patient from you know, a, a drug overdose at a music concert or something. It, it really comes down to undivided attention. And I think traditionally, at least you know, in Victoria, we're not great at necessarily protecting the person who's using the bag valve mask from distractions and everything else. But this last bit about um, undivided attention is essential um, because human beings are kind of like golden retriever puppies where like 
you hear a little sound and you know, you're immediately distracted. And so when you're in the middle of a scene and all the stuff's going on and there's blood and there's screaming and all that stuff, it's very easy to get distracted. In fact, you know, it's not uncommon to practice our scenarios and see the person who's actually leading the entire um, resuscitation actually be the one with the bad valve mask. And that's the worst possible assignment of the bad valve mask because you cannot be juggling all these different variables and expect that you're naturally going to be breathing three seconds in three seconds out. So um, what we really want to do is assign somebody who's dedicated to the mask and then we don't want to bother them. Don't talk to them. Don't ask them where equipment is stored in the vehicle. Just let them focus on their job. And if you notice in a few minutes that they're off, uh, they're off um, distracted with something else and they're not doing 12 breaths per minute, then swap them out with someone who's fresh and who's able to concentrate. And that is going to lead to the best uh, smoothest bag valve mask use possibly. We're going to talk about why this is so essential uh, a little bit later on. Okay, so that's objective one. Objective two, understand what oxygenation and ventilation are and how they're completely independent of each other. Okay, so changing gears, let's look at some more of my lifelike computer graphics and talk about some basic biochemistry. So here's a little cell in your body and cells need energy to survive. So what we're talking about here tonight is really uh, oxygen and glucose and something just popped up here Did, is that a message for me or maybe not okay i'm gonna i'm gonna ignore it until nick interrupts me is that, is so, a, um, it was a john it was a a compliment on the quality of your illustrations that's all oh okay thank you you would not believe how much time i put into this it's actually a little bit embarrassing but thank you <laughs> all right so um so we've got the cell, all cells need energy, and, and tonight we're talking about you know, oxygen, uh, which is combined with glucose, and those go into the cell, into the mitochondria, which are like the little power plants in the cell, and they produce waste, and waste is in the form of carbon dioxide or whatever else. So um, in the context of the larger body, that are handling the exchange of oxygen and CO2, and they're transported by the circulatory system. And this looks like the same process of oxygen going mainly down one side and carbon dioxide mainly coming back the other side, but that would be way too easy. So uh, let's look at this a little bit more detail on what's actually happening with each of these oxygenation and uh, ventilation systems. So in terms of oxygen transport, oxygen can be transported by dissolving itself in the blood. The thing is, though, that if that's the only system we had of oxygen just kind of melting away into the, the liquid portion of the blood, then we'd all be dead. Because oxygen uh, does dissolve, but not nearly well enough. In fact, about 0.03% of the oxygen our body uses is dissolved in blood. What we have instead is something called hemoglobin. And so hemoglobin is a protein which is able to bind and carry four oxygen molecules. And when it does this, when it binds the oxygen molecules and it unbinds them, it actually changes shape. And when it changes shape, it changes its color subtly, but it's enough to allow pulse oximetry technology to work. So hemoglobin is uh, very tightly packed into red blood cells, and red blood cells form the outer wrap which is then in the blood and uh, tr efficiently transports oxygen around the body. So I'll also mention briefly that hemoglobin is responsive to certain body conditions. So for example, in areas of the body where there is higher uh, CO2, where you know, it's being produced in muscle beds or whatever, um, it will actually unload the oxygen more readily. Whereas in low areas of CO2, like in the lungs where it's being taken out of the body, it will um, bind the oxygen more tightly. So it's actually kind of a smart molecule in uh, some respects. Um, and and the, the CO2 concentration is just one of about five or six different variables that allow for this preferential loading or unloading of oxygen, uh, which correlates to you know, areas of the body that are burning more. All right, so back to respiration. When we breathe, we are sucking oxygen into our lungs and uh, into our alveoli, the little oxygen molecules added now. And now the new part, oxygen is lo loaded onto the blood, mainly by hemoglobin binding in the red blood cells, and it's whisked away to the cells that need it for energy metabolism. And this entire process is called oxygenation. All right. Okay, so we're gonna do a little bit of math. And for anybody who doesn't like math, don't worry, this is not hard math, just bear with me. The numbers are less important than understanding the concepts. So 
as, as I think most of us know, an average adult breathes uh, 12 times per minute, and we call that the respiratory rate. And every time we breathe, as I said before, we breathe about half a liter or so. And that's the tidal volume is the technical term for that. So we use those two numbers, those two variables, to calculate something called the minute ventilation. And here's where the math comes in. And the minute ventilation is the total volume of gas that goes in and out of the lungs in the course of one minute. So the amount of gas that's passing by alveolar membranes. And so we get the minute volume by, by multiplying the number of breaths per minute by the size of the breaths. And it's a simple relationship, but it's important because if you breathe more, if you breathe faster per minute, then the total volume of gas going through the lungs goes up. And if you breathe larger breaths with each breath, then the same total volume, excuse me, the minute volume goes up. So, right, not so scary. All right, let's get on to step two. So the average adult breathes about six liters of air per minute, but air is 21% oxygen. And so really we're breathing 21% of six liters or 1.26 liters of oxygen molecules in that six liters, six liters that we're breathing per minute. Hopefully you follow me on that. I don't want anybody to try and remember these numbers because they're really not that important. Rather, I want you to understand the broader concept of what's taking place when we breathe. And now let's look at just a slightly different scenario. Let's apply 100% oxygen to somebody who's still breathing six liters per minute, but now they're getting six liters of oxygen. That is almost five times more oxygen molecules than before. So if all we cared about in respiration was oxygenation, then we're pretty much done because there are very few illnesses which require more than five times the amount of oxygen you normally breathe in on room air. And in fact, if all we cared about was oxygenation on 100% oxygen and with healthy lungs, you could now reduce the minute ventilation by five, say dropping the respiration rate from 12 to just two or three breaths per minute, and, and the healthy adult would still sustain 100% saturations. And if this is the first time you've heard this, it sounds a little bit mind blowing, but in fact, this is something that is very easy to demonstrate when somebody's asleep um, in surgery. At 100% oxygen, it is very easy to keep somebody's oxygen saturation at 100% while they're only breathing at two to three breaths per minute. Everything else will begin to go completely bonkers in a physiological standpoint, but the oxygen level, totally fine. So why am I teaching this? Why am I teaching you this? Because I want you to understand that FiO2, that's the, the fancy technical term for the percentage of oxygen that you're breathing in. Um, I want you to understand that the FiO2 that you're applying to a patient is the single most potent thing you can do to fix someone who's not oxygenating well. Other things make a difference as well, like a blood transfusion, not really a common thing in, in um, uh, first responder practice. But counterintuitively, what doesn't help very much is the minute ventilation. So increasing respiration rate or the minute volume is not really going to help with increasing oxygenation. You can think of artificial respiration kind of as a light switch. We need adequate respiration for oxygenation to work, but pushing harder on the light switch isn't going to make the light brighter. And so hyperventilation does nothing for oxygenation. And this is the crux of, of this segment of the presentation. Please remember this. When you encounter a blue person, what they need is an open airway and they need supplemental oxygen and they need normal respiratory support rates and volumes. They don't need hyperventilation. Hyperventilation is potentially going to be dangerous for them for other reasons. Again, it's very difficult to control yourself when you're distracted. It's very difficult to control what you're doing with the bag valve mask when you've got adrenaline surging through your veins in these situations. And so very commonly, we'll see first responders hyperventilating a critically ill person without even realizing they're doing it. But that's bad, it's potentially harmful. So why do we as humans breathe as much or as little as we do? And what it comes down to, the speed and the size of the breaths doesn't affect the oxygenation, but it has a profound effect on the ventilation. And the ventilation is the technical term for the elimination of CO2 from the body. Now, I know some of you are thinking, but CO2 is a waste product and we wanna get it out of the body, right? Make room for oxygen. Yeah, not really, it doesn't work that way. And now we're gonna talk about why. 
So let's go back to gas dissolved in the blood. We already know oxygen doesn't do a very good job of dissolving the blood, but CO2 actually dissolves really well in the blood, kind of. CO2 by itself doesn't dissolve very well at all, just like the oxygen, only a few molecules go in. But CO2 can combine really easily with water molecules, thanks to a handy, handy little enzyme that we have in our bodies. And this new molecule divides really easily into ions, forming a hydrogen ion and a bicarbonate ion. And those do dissolve really well into the water or blood, uh, which is mostly water. So thank you very much, carbonic anhydrase, for solving this problem for us. Of course, it's not quite that easy. Hydrogen atoms are very acidic. In fact, they are the acid part of any acid. And their partner, bicarbonate, reigns it in a little bit, but not totally. So what we're seeing here is that uh, CO2 accumulation will lead to acidosis, which is the condition where the body becomes more acidic than it should be. And on the other hand, too little CO2 will lead to alkalosis, the condition where the body becomes too basic, which is also not very good. So let's talk about the largest influencers of CO2. Minute ventilation is that, um, that product of respiratory rate and tidal volume. So if you increase either of those, you're gonna blow off more of the acidic carbon, carbon dioxide and the body will become less acidic. But if you are not blowing that off because you're not breathing very quickly or taking very shallow breaths, you're gonna retain CO2, you're gonna retain that acid and so you become more acidic. The brainstem actually detects minute changes in the acid level, in the pH, and that's how our body adjusts breathing, unless we are so exposed to acidic um, uh, CO2 um, intensive environments that we get that hypoxic drive that we used to harp on a lot about in earlier in, in, uh, in, in, in earlier years in first aid training. Um, so. But, but that's very uncommon. So for 99.9% .9 of the population, the drive to breathe is based on the CO2 level, uh, which correlates to the acid level. All right, so that's the difference between oxygenation and ventilation. And you can kind of appreciate how they sort of, it's really easy to kind of combine them together as one single process and not realize how potently different they are and how what, seems to be good for the oxygenation, maybe really bad for the uh, ventilation, the carbon dioxide elimination. All right, so we're on to now objective number three, and that's um, how to, uh, we're, we're gonna understand now how carbon dioxide affects the body's acidity and how, how we have the effect over it in the pre-hospital environment. All right, so back to this slide here. I've added a giant arrow here just to reinforce the fact that CO2 is um, indirectly leads to that strong acid accumulation. And we don't really want acidosis, but we don't want alkalosis either. All right. So why does pH, that's the acidity level, matter? So here's your pH spectrum from zero to 14. And on the one side, we have really acidic things like battery acid. On the other side, we have drain cleaner, um, neither of which are very good for the body. So in the body, we do actually have a fair range of pHs, but they're in very specialized areas. So the stomach uses a very acidic um, environment to break down food and to kill bacteria. And then very quickly, it's reversed as it goes into the first section of the small intestine, the duodenum, and that pH is uh, increased up into the basic range. So you're kind of shocking bacteria and it helps um, break down um, uh, food as well. Um, so, but, but these pH extremes only exist in the digestive system, really, maybe the liver a little bit. For the rest of our body, it needs to be very tightly controlled in this, uh, in this very tight little range. So we're going to zoom in on this, this section of the curve here. So our normal range here is between 7.35 and 7.45. And again, I don't expect anybody to memorize this. It has no bearing on, on what we're doing. I just want you to understand that it is an extremely narrow section of the pH ribbon that we need to live in. If we get far beyond those extremes, then bad things happen. So let's talk a little bit about how the body actually regulates things in such a tight little range. So what we're talking about now is acid homeostasis. And, and um, it comes down to two different flavors of, of um, 
tools that our body uses. So we have buffer systems and we have regulation mechanisms. So let's talk about buffer systems first. I'm gonna draw a little bit of a graph. So now the pH is going up and down vertically on that uh, Y axis. And so what our body does here is we add um, acid molecules going from left to right the buffer system kind of bends this curve, this relationship between the two, so that we end up spending a huge amount of time um, in between the, the, in the, in the sweet spot, right? Between, between uh, 0.35 and 0.45. So you can actually add or take away a lot of acid in that range and still be tightly controlled. And so this is the whole point of buffers. And, and, and we have two major buffer systems in the body, maybe three, but I'm gonna talk about two. The first one is bicarbonate. You're gonna recognize this name and this molecule from the, the earlier in the presentation because when CO2 combines with water, it forms acid and bicarbonate, one of the main buffers in the body. And so we don't want to eliminate all of the bicarbonate from the body because then we would have no buffer and that's not very good either. So this is the major extracellular, meaning outside of the cells uh, system for, for regulation. We also have a phosphate system, but this is mainly intracellular and way beyond the scope of what we're talking about tonight. So we can forget about the phosphate. I just want you to know that there are, there are uh, several buffer systems in the body that help really tightly maintain that acid and let the body absorb or lose a fair amount of acid before you get into the danger zones. Okay, so let's talk about regulation mechanisms now for bicarbonate. And so there are two mechanisms. Number one, respiratory physiology, which is why we're talking about it. And again, how do we maintain that? How does that, that respiratory physiology work? It's all based on the ventilation, that minute ventilation. If you wanna get rid of acid, you breathe faster, you breathe harder. If you want to retain acid, then you breathe slower and, uh, and more shallowly. The other system is uh, the kidneys, the renal metabolism, because kidneys can actually produce and eliminate extra bicarbonate. Um, ions. And so with the combination of these two systems, the body is very capable of maintaining its uh, buffer level and therefore its pH in a very tight fashion. The thing is, is that they operate on very different time scales. The respiratory physiology, very fast. Within a matter of breaths, you can change somebody's pH very profoundly. Whereas the, the kidney metabolism actually takes hours, days for it to begin to kick in. So really it comes down to respiratory physiology, which is why I'm taking so much time tonight talking about acid-base status and the importance of CO2 elimination because ventilation is critical for the maintenance of uh, acid and it's potentially lethal if it's not done correctly. So we've been spending a lot of time on how CO2 impacts acid base, but it also impacts in other ways too. For example, the blood supply in the brain, the cerebral circulation. So here, if you have high carbon dioxide in the brain, your brain detects that and it says, I need more blood to flush this bad stuff out. So it actually dilates the blood vessels, which is not a bad thing. So if you have high CO2, then you are now flushing out the, um, the, brain, the brain likes blood, everybody happy. However, if you have low CO2 from say, um, um, hyperventilating somebody, now those blood vessels are saying, wow, there's not enough CO2, we're getting a little bit too basic, we're gonna clamp down, and it causes vas vasoconstriction to the brain, which is not a good thing. And if you do that um, profoundly enough and for long enough, bad things happen. So, how do we avoid this? How do we know how much is the right amount to breathe through somebody when we're breathing for them? And uh, this comes from uh, wise words of wisdom from uh, first aid teachings. We aim for 12 breaths per minute or, you know, whatever the appropriate is for the, for the, um, the correct age. Children obviously need to be a, little, uh, a lot faster than 12 breaths per minute, but we're talking about adults mainly tonight. So 12 breaths per minute. And again, just enough to make the chest rise. And if you target this, you're targeting normal physiology, and that's going to be pretty much as safe as you can be without having all sorts of invasive, complicated tests that uh, don't exist outside of the hospital. All right. So this is a review slide. It's very busy. We're going to go over this line by line, so don't feel overwhelmed. First, we'll start on the, on the left column there with the oxygen management. So remember, the most potent effect 
on somebody who's hypoxic, who needs more oxygen, is to increase that FiO2, increase the concentration of oxygen that they're breathing. So put your, put your um, oxygen uh, mask on them. Um, but also necessary components, they need to have adequate hemoglobin, they need to, excuse me, <clears throat> they need to obviously have functioning lungs with good surface area, so COPD, or you smoke you know, several packs a day and, and destroy all your alveoli, um, you don't have that surface area anymore. Or you can get lung conditions um, like, you know, for example, um, widespread viral pneumonia or things like that, which cause uh, thickening of the alveoli membranes, which makes it harder for the oxygen to cross into the blood. Um, these are just some examples of, of respiratory disease that can cause, cause oxygenation problems. You have to have airway patency as well, right? If you can't get the air exchanged with the alveoli, then we're in big trouble. Um, but it all comes down to having adequate gas exchange, minute ventilation, Excess minute ventilation has no effect. Just like that light switch analogy, if you push harder on the up part, the lights don't get any brighter. We don't need to hyperventilate. You have to remember this when your patient's blue, they don't need hyperventilation. They just need open airway, adequate ventilation, and some extra oxygen. Okay? And then we'll jump over to the right side of the screen now, the CO2 management. Um, so remember that we're trying to maintain our pH in this very, very narrow range, and it, the pH that is, is profoundly affected by how quickly you're blowing off your carbon dioxide. That's the minute ventilation. So um, if you were to increase your respiratory rate or increase the size of your breath, the tidal volume, you're going to blow off more oxygen and you're going to make the person less acidic, i.e. basic. Or if you reverse that, you're breathing less frequently or your tidal volume is very small, then you're going to retain carbon dioxide and that uh, makes them more acidic. And we, and, and again, the, the FiO2, adding supplemental oxygen, doesn't have any effect on that CO2 management. It's not like the extra oxygen molecules are kicking out the CO2 that's accumulating in your body. It doesn't work that way. So I just want to make that very clear because that's a very common uh, junior medical student mistake. If someone's CO2 is too high, the answer is not uh, adding more oxygen or other things. The answer is to breathe faster and harder for them to increase that minute volume. Uh, okay, good. Um, what did I want to say? I um, just jump in really fast with a quick question here. Uh, yeah, please. Yeah. Just had uh, a, a member of the audience asking uh, if this would be changed uh, in a patient who had thalassemia minor. Uh, if I recall correctly, we've had this question before, and uh, this is someone who's got some experience with that uh, that pathology. Sure. Yeah. It's a good random zebra question. So thalassemia is a genetic um, hemoglobin problem where. This is going back to medical school now, so forgive me if I don't have all of the details correct, but the bigger picture is it's a hemoglobin problem. So the, the, um, the red blood cells are not able to carry as much oxygen or as effectively. And so um, the idea of exchanging more gas through the lungs is not going to have any effect on getting more blood carried, more oxygen carried by the blood. Can you guys kind of appreciate that from what we've already talked about? It has nothing to do with gas getting to the alveoli. It has to do with gas in the alveoli getting into the blood. So no, uh, hyperventilation in thalassemia is not useful in that respect. Now, thalassemia does respond to stress situations. And so if someone is um, acidic for whatever reason, um, then I believe that can, can trigger uh, thalassemic crises and whatnot. And this is really reaching for me right now. I would, I would need to go look this up if somebody with thalassemia actually came into the hospital because you just don't see them very often in Canada. Um, but um, so again, I think the, the key there is that for thalassemia, it's even more important to keep your pH in that tight, tight range. So what they really need is normal um, pH control and normal ventilation. I would not be hyperventilating someone with thalassemia. Is that good? Any follow-ups on that or? No, no other follow-ups there, John. I think that sounded like an excellent okay. explanation. So cool. We can talk more about that at the end too, uh, if you guys want. Okay, good. So, um, right. So I was going to tell you a story here because we've, we've got, we've got a little bit more time here, right? Nick, we doing okay? Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely, John. We've got basically as much time as you'd uh, you'd like to keep. <laughs> 
We normally go about 60 to 90 minutes and we're at 42 right now. So. Okay. All right. Well, good. I'm going to tell you guys a story. Um, so we had a very interesting case um, in, in, uh, in the hospital a couple of weeks ago where one of our patients um, was retaining uh, carbon dioxide. And so um, for whatever reason, she was retaining this carbon dioxide. And so um, she, her, her, so basically she, her, she, her body was becoming acidic. And when your, your acid level gets to a certain point, it actually stuns the brainstem. And so all of your brainstem reflexes are no longer working as efficiently as they should. And so you see this in all sorts of different ways. So for example, altered level of consciousness, um, we uh, began to see irregular breathing at some point. The pupils were super funky. They were like really constricted, but, but asymmetric. And they would respond to light, but really slow to. And then five minutes later, they'd be dilated. And the same thing, like really slow response to light. And so it was this weird flip-flopping because the brainstem can't function properly because everything's too acidic. And yet her oxygen was completely fine because you put a little bit of oxygen on and, and, and she's able to absorb the oxygen and get that off to her cells, but she's not able to ventilate. And what was happening was she was breathing at about 40 breaths per minute and extremely shallow, shallow breaths. And so when you breathe, um, a significant portion of the tidal volume of the, of the air that you take in actually sits in the larger airways, in the bronchi and the trachea, where there's no air exchange. And so the first 150 milliliters, two milliliters per kilogram, the first 150 milliliters of air that you breathe in really only gets into the bronchi and whatnot. So if you're taking breaths that are less than 150 milliliters, you're not really getting any air exchange at the alveoli. So it looks like someone's working really hard to breathe, but if they're not moving the air, then um, basically the CO2 builds up in the lungs and it's not being flushed out of the system. And so the blood level of the CO2 gets higher and higher and higher. And this is what we saw. So we saw basically a hypercarbic respiratory arrest. She didn't actually arrest in her respirations, but she was headed that way. And the solution was um, mechanically very simple, but in a real world um, situation, a lot more complicated. But basically we took over her breathing for her. So we sedated her, we put her on um, uh, a bag valve mask and we breathed for her uh, and we did hyperventilate her uh, to blow off all of that CO2. And after about two to four hours, um, we cleared it all and she woke up and she was totally fine and totally stable. So very interesting case that you really don't see very often. That's probably the first one I've seen in my career, maybe the last one I ever see in my career. But it just is another illustration of how the oxygenation and the carbon dioxide elimination, the ventilation, are completely separate processes. And sometimes they get unlinked and, um, and it's, it's a tricky thing to figure out. Not that you really need to worry about that at the, uh, the pre-hospital level. Okay, good. So uh, let's go over why bag valve ma mask use really matters. So um, again, we have this physiologic minute ventilation, the calculation there, uh, anything that causes the respirate or the tidal volume to go up or both is going to uh, increase your, your oxygen, uh, pardon me, your carbon dioxide blowing off. But, but physiologically, what we're looking at is an adult breathing at 12 breaths per minute, about half a liter, about six liters per minute. This means you've got good oxygenation, you've got good carbon dioxide elimination. Now we're going to take this person and we're going to put them in the hands of an inexperienced, panicked first aider who's using all of the tools they have available to them. And so um, what we have here now is the panicked BVMer who's now giving 25 breaths per minute without realizing what they're doing. And they're giving just half, not even you know the full thing, but just half of this two liter bag at a liter per minute. That's now 25 liters per minute at 100% oxygen. Again, the oxygenation really doesn't matter at this point, but what we're getting is great oxygenation, but we're getting terrible CO2 management. So, the big take home from this tonight is that CO2 balance really matters. That's the ventilation component. It's very, very, very important. So <clears throat> in terms of managing our respiratory problems well, here are the things we need to remember as um, pre-hospital um, providers. Number one, make sure the airway is open, clear, maintained, because without that, we're not going to get any gas exchange. That's not good. Number two, we're going to give supplemental oxygen. 
And number three, we're gonna provide normal physiologic respiratory support. No hyperventilation, no hypoventilation, 12 breaths per minute, just enough to make the chest rise. We accomplish this <clears throat> by assigning one person with no distractions, that's their sole job is the BVM, and that's the ideal world. Now, is that uh, possible in the real world? I don't know, it depends on the situation. But in an ideal world, that's what we're doing. The last thing you want is trying to lead a primary survey, rapid body survey, trying to tell somebody how to hold a uh, pressure point on a bleeding artery while you're trying to remember in for three seconds slowly, out for three seconds slowly. All right, and that is the end of my presentation. Are there any questions? John, we just had a great question uh, that was just sent to, to, to the admin account here privately. Um, if a patient is dehydrated, is it more difficult for the carbon dioxide to attach for elimination due to less H2O in the system? Great question, no. Um, the amount, the number of CO2 molecules in our body in any given time is a drop in the bucket compared to the amount of water molecules in our body at any, in any given time. Remember that our body by weight is like 60 to 70% water. So even if you're really dehydrated, the, there's never um, a lack of water for CO2 um, metabolism. Good question though. Someone's paying attention. That's what I said. Um, I had a question for you, John, and this, uh, if this goes a little bit, uh, it's kind of a rehash of a lot of the stuff that you were talking about, but I'm hoping you can maybe put it into sort of a, a slightly more condensed answer. Um, one of the things that we struggle with a lot in, uh, in the street, and this is me wearing my work hat just a little bit here as well, um, but one of the things we, we struggle with a lot in the, uh, the, uh, the resuscitation of particularly opiate overdoses in a street setting or in a and specifically community resuscitation overdoses in a street setting is um, very often, um, very often uh, there are other agencies or multiple agencies involved that don't have the background skill training experience that, that a lot of us who, who do this professionally do. Um, and there's a tendency to just go and, uh, you know, oxygenate someone uh, just with a nasal cannula to bring the row two sets up because we have a pulse oximeter that shows you the number that says hundred now that's great. And we can give you four liters and that's helping. Um, could you maybe just do like a, a, a quick like one or two minute sound bite that we could sort of break off from this to, to explain why that's problematic and why stimulating either intrinsic respiration or providing ventilation is important? Okay. <laughs> Don't put me on the spot or anything. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> I, uh, okay. It's sort of so, saying all the stuff we talked about earlier. I just... Uh, I, totally. I, I'm, I'm thinking that I might break this off for people who sure. don't have time to watch the whole video, um, but it makes totally. it really useful yeah. to have. No, no problem. So basically when, so the question is, when you have somebody who has an opiate overdose, for example, and they're breathing very slowly, very small amounts, and they're not exchanging enough oxygen, they're not getting enough oxygen into their body, and they're not eliminating enough carbon dioxide. Is it okay just to put, say, nasal cannula on and uh, um, when their sats come up, is that sufficient? Um, and it's, it's, it's a really good question. Certainly when you provide that supplemental oxygen, you are going to rapidly increase the amount of oxygen in the lungs by a factor of five, perhaps. And that is often more than enough to bring the saturations right up to 100%. But what it's missing is the fact that it's doing nothing for taking the carbon dioxide that's dissolved in your blood and getting that out of the blood, into the lungs, and out of the body. And because carbon dioxide is essentially acid in your body, that person may have sats of 100% on your little machine, but their internal acid level is skyrocketing. And as we know, um, it doesn't take a lot of acid to cause really bad things, i.e. death. So yes, oxygenation, very important, but the respiratory support, either by giving naloxone and reversing the effects and letting them breathe on their own and blow off their own CO2, or just taking over their, their respiratory function with a bag valve mask and breathing for them to eliminate that carbon dioxide and get it out of the body is critical. And if we don't do that, we are risking causing brain damage, frankly. How was that? 
That was an ex excellent condensed answer, John. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, <laughs> Did that fit in two minutes? I don't know. <laughs> no, no, that was, that, was, that was perfect. I'm gonna bug you about this again because I have an idea for a little offshoot video doing sure. as well maybe that, that might be actually really useful for the community. Yeah. Um, I could do another, more animations. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have another question here. Uh, if a patient has COPD and has trouble getting breaths out, how should we assist? Uh, and then we have a second question, also with overdoses, if the patient's teeth are clenched together, what's the best way to oxygenate? I have some thoughts on the second teeth clenched and trismus answer, um, but maybe let's take the COPD first and then do OD second. Sure, I apologize. I was just looking to see if I can figure out where the little uh, conversation box is and I, I'm having trouble. So I, I'm sorry, can you ask the first question again? Uh, sure, John, the question was, if a patient has COPD and has trouble getting breaths out, how should we assist? Sure. So COPD um, and, and, and really severe asthma are the same flavor of lung disease. It's called obstructive lung disease. And the issue for those is not getting air in. The issue is that as the air is coming out, you can get collapse of the little airways. And so you end up with a lot of residual contaminated air kept in the alveoli. And so you're getting CO2 retention. And furthermore, um, what we get is that breath stacking that I was referring to earlier, earlier where you put uh, a, you know, half a liter in, but you only get um, a third of a liter out. And then you put half a liter in and you only get a third of a liter out. So those lungs are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and then kaboom. So the key there is twofold. Number one, if there is anything you can do to help facilitate the air getting out more effectively, do it. So that might be things like um, uh, Ventolin, for example, drugs that are going to cause the airways that are in constriction to relax a little bit if there are airways in constriction, and sometimes there aren't. Um, and, and so anything that's going to remove those obstructions or, or lessen those obstructions is going to help with that more effective gas um, exhalation. The other thing is time. So I've been, I've, been, I've been preaching this three seconds in, three seconds out. That's not going to work for this particular population. If somebody is retaining air, they need more time for exhalation. Because if you do nothing and you just let those lungs kind of take care of themselves, eventually they're going to um, collapse completely. The problem is, is the person going to be starved for oxygen while that's happening? And, and that's where we get into this rock and a hard place situation. But you can adjust your bag valve mask approach by, for example, giving a breath over one second and giving five seconds for exhalation. And, and these are techniques we use in the hospital. So that's not certainly, it's not something you want to be applying um, to anybody. You want to think about it very carefully, um, but that is the technique that we're using. And it comes with a little bit of risk because we are now using higher pressures um, to get that oxygen, to, to, I'm sorry, to get the air in and allowing the trade-off being that more time for the air to naturally come out on its own. Um, and, and so there's a whole field of critical care that looks at this where we're actually intentionally giving people less oxygen or accepting the fact that we are keeping their saturations in the 80s because we're breathing so slowly and so um, so such small tidal volumes that we're trying to minimize the amount we put in to get more out in exchange. But that requires sedation and complicated monitoring and whatnot. But hopefully that, that does justice to answering that COPD question. But that, uh, that sounded like a fantastic answer, John. Um, Thank you. So the, second, uh, the second part of that question, uh, and this was from Lee San in, uh, in, uh, somewhere in BC here, um, with overdoses, if the patient's teeth are clenched together, what's the best way to oxygenate? And I, I might just freelance in here and just make the point that there's, there's two possible things that could be going on there. One is, one is trismus uh, or hypoxic trismus, and the second being wooden chest syndrome. And they're kind of different beasts. And I don't know if you want to talk about both or, or how you'd like to tackle that. But. Okay, well, um... I guess the first thing to realize is that you don't actually need the teeth open to get air around them because you've got the nasal passages and you've got um, all these gaps um, in and around the teeth. And so, you know, for example, people will have 
um, jaw surgery where someone goes in and a, a surgeon goes in and breaks the jaw and lengthens and, and wires it shut and um, and you physically cannot open the mouth without bolt cutters um, and so it's still possible to bag those people around these um, these things so you know, trismus where the muscles are clenched or for whatever reason, you know, the jaw, you can't open the jaw, um, shouldn't really be um, an issue in most cases. Um, sometimes if you have poor air circulation for other reasons, then it can be a real problem. And in that case, I don't know that I have um, anything at the pre-hospital level that's going to work well for that. Um, you know, I, I think it just comes back to the basics. Do whatever you can to open that airway, a little bit of head snap, a little bit of jaw thrust, and, um, you know, some very careful um, trying to tease the, uh, the oxygen, the, the air around. Uh, go ahead and put two nasal trumpets in, you know, what, whatever you need to do to try and open that airway patently is probably the only thing you can do. Um, <clears throat> what else? Oh, sorry, the part B, what were you thinking about the, the Something with the chest, Nick? Yeah, sorry, John. Uh, so this is something we've seen, and, and I don't know if this gets seen as much in the emergency department, so I'm not sure, because this is very much a, a more of a street phenomenon, and I understand from some of my uh, uh, anesthesia colleagues that uh, uh, it, it's been recognized in the OR settings as well, um, but something called wooden chest syndrome, which is a, uh, it's a sort of paradoxic effect to very high-dose, high-potency opiates, uh, in which yeah. the test wall and, and certainly you know, you'll get even um, tonic muscle contractions throughout the rest of the body as well. And that poses, you know, you'll sometimes first recognize that in a patient in what appears to be or is a trismus because their jaw locks up. But then when yeah. you start ventilating them, you realize that their entire chest wall has gone into a, 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 a sort of a, a spasm. And yes. that, of course, is a different issue than just getting past the trismic jaw. Um, certainly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that would fall under the same category as why you can't bag uh, somebody who's actually actively seizing, right? Because if they're actively seizing, their chest is in, in some sort of rigid state, you would never be able to overcome the muscle power uh, to inflate the lungs. So same sort of idea. Um, and, and you're right, it is, it is a well-known phenomenon inside the hospital. It's extremely rare. It, it comes from high dose opiates. Um, and, you know, I mean, I've been practicing anesthesiology for a decade now or so, and I haven't yet to see it. Um, but I guess the answer is it comes from opiates. So give a little naloxone, why not? Um, it's probably going to help. Um, excuse me, the other thing you can do is, uh, is just persist. Because what happens is as the body becomes hypoxemic, meaning you don't have enough oxygen, at some point, everything's going to relax. The patient's going to go, uh, well, they're probably altered already, but at some point, the brainstem is going to lose function because there's so little oxygen and everything relaxes. And so, uh, you know, just keep persisting because at some point that will break and you can then take over at that point. So those would be my two initial thoughts. If you are an advanced care provider, then you probably have muscle relaxant drugs, uh, which are effective as well, but we don't need to talk too much about that. Do you have any other thoughts other than that, Nick? Um just that my own experience, John, would echo that quite a bit um, without going too far down the rabbit hole. I've, I've had a lot of experience working both um, in the downtown east side and, and working in local uh, in Victoria supervised consumption and overdose prevention environments. And I've certainly had at least, at least three or four extremely clear cut wooden chest. We know this person just intentionally in ingested what was believed to be fentanyl or carfentanyl or whatever high potency opiate is, is on the street that day, um, and, and had this uh, you know <clears throat> chest wall rigidity. Um, and I've probably had several dozen other patients that have gone through a phase of chest wall rigidity and then self resolved out of that as their overdose has progressed. Um, in a couple of cases. Uh, um, and this this gets into some clinical decision making that that I I'm reluctant to encourage for others, but uh, but certainly at, at the at the time as we're trying to problem solve this airway issue, um, using some naloxone uh, to try and reverse that effect of the opiate. It's going to help with the breathing, but it'll also maybe help with uh, the chest wall rigidity. Certainly, in the couple of cases that we had that. It, it, you were almost using the naloxone. You're still trying to ventilate, of course, but the naloxone almost becomes an airway intervention at that point because the effects of the opiate are what's obstructing the airway. And by by reversing yes. that, it, it's a bit of a it's a bit of an odd way to think about it. 
it's certainly not common. It's certainly not the first, if, if you've got someone who's got a locked up jaw, um, shouldn't be necessarily the first thing you're thinking about, but that's, that's, it, it's happened a few times. It's, it's yeah. out there. Yeah. Um, yeah. We had, uh, I don't know, John, if you want anything else on that, we have a, a few more questions cr uh, cropping up here as well. Uh, yeah, no, I, uh, no, I think we covered that well. I mean, it's, it's probably something you're going to see a lot more, Nick, because it's, as you say, uh, you know, a rare side effect of high dose opiates and beyond doses that we typically use in the hospital. So yeah, but enough said, let's move on. Yes. Um, so uh, we have from uh, Nicole Renkema. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, Nicole, uh, your last name right. Uh, the current training policies are using two person uh, on the BVM, one seal in the mask and one squeeze in the bag. As a trainer and remaining with the current training policies, uh, do a three second squeeze and a three second, three plus second exhale, or should we use a three second squeeze and a three plus second exhale? Um, she says, uh, I'm not wording that quite right, but trying to understand how best to train first aiders with this difficult piece of equipment, BLS and OFA3 are recommending two persons on the BVM. Um. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I I agree with everything being said there. I, I'm not sure where the question is. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm I'm just sort of reading out here what people have, what people have typed in. But I I, I it sounds like uh, Nicole's asking if two person BVM technique is, is a good idea. And I mean, my first or is appropriate and consistent with the training policies, and and also using three second in, three second out uh, uh, ventilation. And I I think the answer is a resounding yes. Um, yes. Uh, I don't know if there's much else to add to that. Um, I would say that you know when you're when you're doing a first aid response, you have a limited number of resources, and that includes other first aid trained or non first aid trained colleagues that can help you. And so, all else being equal, if you've got a second person to assist, then absolutely uh, use two people. And I would say the the best qualified person should be doing the seal um, for as long as possible because at some point your hands gonna cramp up but that's where their skill should be invested because the seal of this thing and forgive me this is still wrapped because I want to keep it clean um, but uh, the seal of this is far more difficult than teaching somebody how to squeeze for three seconds and release for three seconds and say okay a little bit more next time a little bit less next time whatever so I totally agree but if you are you know in some trauma situation and you've got competing priorities and limited resources, you may not have that luxury and that second person might be better spent doing something else, calling an ambulance or whatever. So Nicole just clarified uh, that I guess uh, some of her materials don't say how many seconds to squeeze the bag for and that was what she was looking for clarification on. Yeah. I, I would totally uh, insist on three seconds in and three seconds out and you know as I say, I review the St. John stuff, not that I've done the, the bag valve mask section at all, but you know, if we were reviewing that, I, you know, I, I know the, uh, the team of doctors that review the stuff and I, I can pretty much guarantee that would be the recommendation from the doctors that create the current recommendations for St. John ambulance, you know, as to who makes the OFA and other stuff, I, I don't know, but, um, but for sure, I think three seconds on three seconds off would be the way to go. Yeah. Good question. Uh, great answer. Thank you, John. Uh, next question from Marlon. Um, would carbon monoxide poisoning, CO poisoning, cause the same acidity issues in the body as CO2? And how do we address CO poisoning, carbon monoxide poisoning? Yep. Um, I, I, just as we're talking about this, John, just to put the bug in your ear, uh, this begs some pretty serious safety questions as well as just response uh, medical intervention questions. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, you're right. Um, <clears throat> so carbon monoxide, completely different. I know it. I know it looks when it's written down CO and CO2. It looks very similar, but completely different beasts. And carbon monoxide is very toxic, as we know. Car exhaust, internal combustion, um, house fires. You know, you get the the carbon monoxide being produced. You get the cyanide being produced. Carbon monoxide's up there with cyanide in terms of how bad it is. Um, so yeah, everything that I've said about CO2 tonight has nothing to do with carbon monoxide. And really, you know, I think carbon monoxide deserves its own presentation, but real quick, uh, carbon monoxide competes with oxygen at the hemoglobin level. So um, I showed that, that, um, that image of the hemoglobin and the four oxygen molecules binding to it. Carbon monoxide will bind to the hemoglobin more tightly than oxygen, rendering that 
that binding site not available for oxygen. And so if you um, <clears throat> have someone with too much carbon monoxide, they're done. There's no way to, to fix them. Um, they're gonna they're gonna die before you can get them to where they need to be. Now, if for, for more moderate or mild cases, the, the treatment is high flow oxygen. Because if I have a bit of carbon monoxide in my system, and I do because, you know, I went out today to the parking lot and I breathed in a little bit of um, uh, exhaust as a car went by inadvertently. I walked past a smoker and breathed a little bit in. So we all have a little bit of carbon monoxide in our system. But that carbon monoxide will, uh, over time, flop off and, and, and get breathed out. It's, it, it works into, into this half-life concept, which you know um, some of us will be familiar with. So, and again, I'm, I'm trying to go on memory here, but I believe the half-life of carbon monoxide, if you do nothing, is about six hours. So if my carbon monoxide level right now is two on the blood test, in six hours, it'll be one. And six hours from then, it'll be half. Um, and I'm just, I'm just making up arbitrary numbers here for the point of the illustration. If you put someone on high flow oxygen, now you have all these extra oxygen molecules. So when that CO flips off, you're more likely to get another oxygen in there real quick before the CO can flip back on. And so your half-life goes from, I think about six hours with nothing to about 90 minutes with high flow oxygen. Do those numbers jive with what you recall, Nick? Um, off the top of my head, yes, John, but it's been a while since I had my face in a, any of those books to, to really verify that, so. yeah. Yeah, so don't quote us, but that's more or less the, the, um, the, uh, the theory behind it. So again, with carbon monoxide poisoning, you don't really need to do anything with respiration. You just need the high flow of oxygen on, unless the person is, is comatose, in which case I would stick with your normal physiologic ventilation because you don't want to be messing up the CO2 level. And the carbon monoxide has nothing to do with the carbon dioxide metabolism, but you don't want to be over um, ambitiously hyperventilating someone and blowing off too much CO2 as, as uh, a side effect. Does that make sense? I think just, John, I just wanted to really touch on this because this is something that's a, that's a, a, a touchy subject for a lot of first responders. Um, the the uh, Certainly, and I've, I've been asked recently to not identify my own employer uh, uh, publicly. I think a lot of people know who, who I am, where I work. Um, but uh, um, for a lot of first responders, we have we have seen quite a few um, paramedics and firefighters and other rescue personnel succumb to carbon monoxide exposure. Um, yeah. Carbon monoxide is is odorless, it's tasteless, um, it's something that that uh, you will not necessarily, as as someone who might be exposed to, it, become aware that you're being exposed <laughs> to. And so, in any situation where you're responding to someone who, who might have uh, uh, carbon monoxide exposure, whether that's because of a self-harm attempt, uh, because they've been in a confined space with a vehicle running, or you're suspecting uh, any of anything else, um, or any other airborne uh, toxin, really, the appropriate response at the St. John level is to call 911 and stand very far back and wait for the people with appropriate rescue equipment to come. Um, yep. We have absolutely killed people in British Columbia as, as first responders, not St. John specifically, but first responders. We have killed people by putting them into environments uh, yeah. with carbon monoxide. You'll see um, the majority, in theory, all paramedics in British Columbia now actually carry carbon monoxide, personal carbon monoxide detectors on their person at all times throughout their shift um, because we've had too many exposures. Uh, and I, I think it's, uh, I, I think it's just, worth really re-emphasizing. Yeah. Um, multiple people unconscious inside a building and you don't know why a car yeah. engine running or an indication of intentional self-harm or self-gassing. Um, all yeah. of these things are just just stay away, call someone else who can help. A um, couple more. I think, uh, you know, Nick, I think you could expand that too because it's not just carbon monoxide or cyanide. Yeah. There are ma many other gases that are you know largely colorless, odorless. And uh, you know, mining sites, industrial sites, same sort of thing. It doesn't have to be an engine or some source of carbon monoxide. If you see multiple people affected in the same enclosed space, you have to assume it's some sort of toxic exposure until proven otherwise. Absolutely, and that includes actually while we're, while we're on the side, that includes anoxic uh, environments as well in confined spaces, yeah. which we have also seen uh, have have really unfortunate results. A big rabbit hole to go down. Let's not go down it deeply tonight. Totally. Exercise totally. caution. 
call rescue personnel. Uh, the guys with the SCBA gear will come in and, and deal with things appropriately. Yeah. Um, uh, we had the CO poison question. Um, uh, we had from Lee Sam uh, just a comment that she's seen uh, uh, clenching and trismus and possibly wouldn't just uh, happen when responding uh, to overdoses in a work housing program. Um, and that Narcan was, or Naloxone was successful in, uh, in resuscitating that person that eventually. Good. Excellent. So, um, yeah. uh, we see from, uh, from John, from Andy and Shirley Philpot, uh, a special thanks on behalf of all the members uh, from Division 518 and Kamloops that are watching tonight. Um, Fran, Hi guys, I miss you. Yeah. I have your little plaque on my wall at home. <laughs> Um, we have from Franco Sartre, uh, thank you, Dr. Jonathan, very well presented for an old guy, really enjoyed some clarity. Um, uh, <laughs> we have uh, uh, a number of other thanks from uh, Rowena Dato, or Dato, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, Rowena. Um, thanks from uh, Bryce, I believe that's Bryce in Kamloops as well, probably. Uh, thanks from Patricia Brewster at 518. I'm not sure where 518 is, guys, someone's going to have, oh, that's Kamloops, is, that's Kamloops as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'll uh, thanks to you from Stuart and the Phil Potts and uh, Ambilica and uh, oh and I have a, a last comment from Lee San here harmonica playing is an ex is excellent for lung health because of the focused inhalation and exhalation to get notes out uh, and apparently Lee San really enjoys <laughs> harmonica playing um, and it's taught in Japanese schools oh and we have uh, we have uh, Gordon Goglia telling us he's from uh, Division Nine Ten in Newmarket Ontario hi Gordon welcome oh. thank you for joining us again. Um, if anyone has any more questions, you've got maybe a minute uh, while we have Dr. Wallace on the line here, um, maybe just a minute to, uh, to fire those into the chat and uh, otherwise uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll call it an evening, folks. Um, John, I might just, uh, in a moment, I'm just gonna set up a new group chat I'll or a new Zoom chat, I'll just email you because I'd love to just have a quick, uh, quick follow-up chat with you in a moment here. Um, yeah, no problem. Um, I'll send you an email uh, link, um, but I have to finish this uh, this group chat here first. Um, I see folks problem. starting to file out of the room here. Um, last chance for questions. Going once, going twice. Um, oh, uh, a question from Lisanne. Uh, what about flail chest? Should we just cover it? That's actually a good question because the flail chest protocol has changed uh, notably in my time um, from what it used to be. Um, and then we also have Gord asking for some information on thalassemia minor. Gord, uh, I think that the thalassemia stuff, I, I'm gonna just, before John gets to Lee question here, I think the thalassemia stuff, it sounds like this is a, a, a thing that particularly affects you. It's probably worth following up with uh, with your own physician or walk-in clinic um, mm -hmm. to help also, you. If I may, uh, excuse me, I just went on. Um, talking to you. I have and I can't seem to get information. As you can tell from my name, I am talking about me personally and how to react as far as first aid goes, not as far as the other medical aspects of it. Right. So maybe John, we'll, we'll go back to the, if you want to address that any further, John, um, I, I'm not sure what else to, to add there. The question was any further information on providing first aid treatment for thalassemia minor? Uh, yeah, you know, I'm probably the wrong person to ask or because like I've been practicing now for, you know, about 20 years and I have yet to see a case of thalassemia that, um, you know, is, is other than, other than something that's silent or a carrier or whatever. So I have no personal experience and my knowledge is quite dated on it. So I don't know that I have a lot more to add on that. I'm afraid I'm, I'm not just not a good source for that. Yes. Yeah. Again, I know from the other aspects of it, but uh, my thing is, you know, uh, does it change if you do a uh, staff monitoring on it? Does it change if, uh, you know, how you apply oxygen? That's the type of questions I'm asking. Okay. No, I, I, don't, I wouldn't change anything in the first aid book for treatment of thalassemia. Okay. Yeah. You've answered my question. Then. Thanks very much. Yeah, no, no problem. Yeah. Um, and then just just going back, Lee San's question about flail chest. Do we just cover it? Maybe just a quick uh, a quick review of that, John. Okay, so uh, so flail chest is when you have a uh, rib cage with multiple ribs broken in more than one place. So you actually have a segment of the chest wall that's moving back and forth um, paradoxically. So as you breathe in, 
instead of the chest wall segment moving out, it gets sucked in and vice versa. As you exhale, that segment moves out classically is how it's described. That's different than a sucking chest wound, which we also refer to as covering. So, so, um, so the flail chest, and you know, I, I apologize if I'm not up on the current first aid treatment guidelines for it, but my recollection is you stabilize it. So you, you kind of put a bunch of pressure bandages on that to try and prevent it from moving in the chest wall. Because the issue is not so much that it's moving and causing damage, but more that it's so painful that that person is not able to take big enough breaths. And so they begin to hypoventilate and they, they may potentially begin to retain CO2 and whatnot, just like I was talking about with my, my example case there. So it's more about pain control and splinting, as I recall. And I apologize if, if I'm not up to date on the latest first aid guidelines there, but essentially that person needs to go to a hospital, get an epidural, get admitted, and give them some time or maybe some surgery to, to, to repair this. So I left myself right there. Um, yeah, I, I think, John, I mean, that certainly, rec you know, uh, echoes my own understanding. I do recall that there used to be some concern about uh, sharp ends of the bones lacerating the, um, the, the sort of intercostal blood vessels and potentially causing a hemothorax and all this sort of thing. Um, you know, certainly in my own experience, the small number of these that I've, I've dealt with personally, it, it's been more about supporting the patient through their their own independent ventilation rather than minimizing the injury uh you know um yep. and cole just adds uh, just support with helper hands try to reduce the paradoxical movement which is you know yeah helper yep. hands. Uh, padding isn't a bad idea um just don't get bogged down in in spending 20 minutes trying to construct this arts and crafts project um, <laughs> agreed <laughs> <laughs> um something worth worth mentioning actually i i, I am aware uh there was some controversy uh, a while ago um and i'll be i'll be cautious about how i address this but um uh someone had been suggesting uh that using elastic zap straps the, the orange trauma straps to encircle the chest to hold that uh padding in place over the flail segment might be helpful and uh i, I think that the decision around that if anyone had been taught that or learned that that is certainly not an endorsed practice, uh, simply because yeah. that elasticity constricts further chest wall movement. Totally, um, yeah. That would people, be a double disorder potentially. Yeah, I, you know, I understand where the theory came from and stuff, but if, if that was something that, uh, that that you were taught, maybe just a reminder that that's not a, a really endorsed or clinically great uh, clinically great practice. Um, yeah. If we don't see any more, uh, if we don't see any more questions, um, thank you everyone for participating this evening. Um, more thanks from uh, Lisanne and uh, saying she enjoyed my arts and crafts project. It's a thing in first aid. People get into these like you. You have fun in class doing these like really elaborate like splinting projects, and it's kind of fun to make the class more interesting. And you get out in the real world and you see people spending half an hour doing this thing with tape, and there's like sparkles and a snowflake on it, and it's just you know, um, you know, very utilitarian is is normally the way to go. Um, Merry Christmas, Christmas from Andy and Shirley. Um, Merry Christmas to you guys as well and your whole division, everyone, of course. Uh, just a reminder to everyone, this is the last, uh, this is the last uh, Monday session of uh, 2020. We will be taking a break for the Christmas holidays. Um, we, we did talk about doing a, a session next week uh, and we didn't have any presenters sort of like chomping at the bit for that time slot. And uh, we're anticipating that everyone's going to be sort of ramping up and getting busy for, for a, a really quite unusual holiday season. So uh, we look forward to seeing you guys in, uh, in 2021. Um, we don't know which Monday we're starting on, probably the first or the second possibly Monday of the month. Um, but please stay tuned. You guys should all have uh, access to the, uh, to the email um, to make sure you're signed up for that if you're in BC. We're going to be trying to advertise more broadly through the provincial mailing list as well. If you're outside of BC, uh, you guys can head to YouTube and search for SJA Vic BC, uh, and you'll find all of our videos. You'll find information on the video title slides about how to sign up for email notifications about these sessions uh, and all that stuff. Um, you're welcome to catch us on social media again, SJA Vic BC. And um, Merry Christmas, everyone. I hope everyone has a, a fantastic. Uh, a fantastic uh, holiday season. I hope uh, it's, it's, you know, I know it's a bit unusual for everyone, but I hope everyone uh, manages to find a way to make it work. Thank you for participating this year. 
Uh, it's been a, a really exceptional and unusual year for us, and I'm really glad we've been able to uh, to do these sessions. And um, yeah, we'll see you guys in uh, see you guys in 2021. Take care, everyone. Have a good night.